Okay, it doesn't work. So, <clears throat> hi, my name is uh, Michal Atnazov. I'm from a company called SunHOS. And uh, I'll be talking about how to migrate to AWS without a mental breakdown. Uh, if my computer works. <laughs> oh, OK. So uh, first, I'm going to tell you something about uh, SignHOS and what we do. So we have some context. And then uh, I'll be talk talking about how we migrated to uh, AWS. So it's going to be more like a case study related to our particular experience. Then we will, I will tell you like what went wrong during that process and uh, how much maybe it cost us in money and emotions and stress. And uh, then what we learned from it, maybe what can you learn from it. Uh, and then maybe if I have still have time, I can talk about uh, some other interesting things that we do on uh, AWS. So SunHOS. SunHOS is an out-of-the-box solution for device management monitoring and content delivery designed for digital signage. It's a, so uh, device management, monitoring, and content delivery. But what is, digi what, what is digital signage? Does anybody know what is digital signage? Uh, maybe not all of you know what it is, so I'll, I'll uh, explain a little bit. So basically, digital signage is uh, all around you, wherever you go pretty much in this world. If you go to a shopping mall, or the airport, or pretty much anywhere where there's like any digital screens that show ads or information, that's all digital signage. And usually uh, the way it works is that there's either like a small, small computer plugged in behind the screen, or the screen itself is a, pretty much a computer with a built-in chip, and it runs some software that, con that controls the, the content that, that it's showing. And uh, there are many companies in this business who create so-called uh, content uh, management systems that control this content on these devices usually through the cloud so you can manage like bigger networks of these devices etc and um, there are many uh, uh, many and many of these companies who have different solutions for this problem but they have a big problem and the digital signage is actually this so this is how it looks in the, under the hood there's many many different manufacturers of different hardware this hardware runs different different systems, different operating systems. Like for example, there's Samsung, there's LG, there's Windows computers. Pretty much, if you want to have, if you want to be relevant in this business, you have to do a lot of software development. You need to, uh, you can imagine, like if you're making a mo mobile app, you need to make pretty much the same mobile app for Android and then duplicate all of that for iOS, and you have to maintain this the duplication between the systems. In this case, there are not two system systems; there are more like 15 systems. So it's even worse. And that's why SignageOS exists. So what SignageOS is trying to do is to take away all this complexity of the development and uh, from these companies and just allow them to create like one code base that works uh, the same across all these different systems. And SignageOS takes care of the rest. So as you can see over there, there's like a <coughs> developer that he creates like this one code base, then it somehow gets fed into SignageOS system some magic happens, and then no matter what system, no, no matter what device is in the end, in the, in the shopping mall or the airport, it runs no, it, it runs the same from the point of view of that developer. He just writes one code. Uh, that code is HTML, pretty much a web application, HTML, JavaScript, and then it, it's using a certain API that we inject into that code that allows to control uh, the functions of this of the devices and to show the content, etc. So uh, what SignageOS really is, is two components. Is the SDK, so like the software development kit for the developers to write the application in JavaScript. And it's also a cloud platform which connects everything together, the devices to the cloud and the developer to the cloud. And then it pushes the whatever the de uh, developer created to those devices. And then it, it also allows for a monitor, like real-time monitoring of, the dis of these devices and control all the functions, etc. <coughs> and then, um, yes, uh, there's constant just communication back and forth. So that's what SignageOS is. Right now, we have about uh, about five thousand devices in production all over the world in US, in uh, Europe, Asia, Australia. Uh, dozens of different companies that work with us, and we are constantly growing. Uh, so, before we migrated to AWS, 
we that our system looks pretty much like this. Like you maybe are familiar with this kind of uh, infrastructure, uh, some data center, a bunch of virtual servers. Uh, you know, server one, two, three, four, up to you know how many you need. Uh, some various databases that we need for our for us to work, like Postgres, MongoDB, Redis, distributed among these servers, and then a bunch of microservices that run in one or many replicas in uh, just Docker, <coughs> just Docker, and uh, all of this, uh, like just um, uh, manually controlled and changed however we need it at the time. Not very fancy, but it worked until a certain point. Uh, and then, yeah, that, that's how it was before. But uh, it's maybe the, the pros of this approach is that it's easy to understand. You know, we can easily train a person to uh, help you man managing this kind of stuff because everybody's familiar with this basic approach. But the, the, the concept is, is that it's very manual, it's not flexible you know, and uh, we are running into a big wall we couldn't scale with uh, our new customers so we decided to go to AWS uh, because for obvious reasons it's flexible you can have you get a lot of options for automation uh, you can better control the cost and uh, it's just overall more reliable so we when we we sit, we sit down we plan how we're doing, gonna do the migration. Uh, we said, okay, we don't need uh, anything fancy. We're just going, we're going to do it like old-fashioned way. It should work, no problem. So we're just going to replicate the databases, create new replicas on the AWS, make sure that all the data is replicated. Then uh, we set up a clone of all the services that we have running. We set up it on AWS as well. Then uh, once that's uh, up and running, we switch the DNS so the traffic starts flowing to AWS. And then finally, we can switch the primary databases from the uh, old data center to the AWS. And then we can completely cut off the old data center and then we profit and it's going to work and everything is going to be nice. Uh, so that's what we did actually. So we first had the original infrastructure. Then then we wanted to um, we create a secondary uh, databases in AWS. It just replicate all the data, so it pretty much copies all the data. Uh, then we create the copy, the services in Kubernetes in AWS. Then we switch the traffic to AWS, and then finally we can get rid of the old services, switch the databases to so that AWS is uh, the primary, and then we co can completely cut off the old, old uh, data center. So the way that we uh, did the Database, database replication. Uh, I'm aware that there are maybe some better ways how to do this, but we just assume this is going to be fine because uh, it's not that complicated uh, for us. So that's what we did. So uh, we needed, uh, we had too many database instances, so we couldn't really get like elastic IP to every instance. So we just decided to create like a bastion server, which is a proxy, and then um, with uh, just some port forwarding connect the two uh, networks together so they they can have they can be like one replica set uh, yeah why not give elastic IP to every instance because there are too many instances uh, for the, the, the microservices part we set up a kubernetes cluster in EKS and then uh, we already had all the docker images prepared but we had to because we didn't run on kubernetes before we had to prepare Helm charts uh, for everything that we run. In case you don't know, uh, Helm, it's a great tool for easily deploying uh, just anything in Kubernetes. Uh, you can, you should definitely uh, look it up and learn more about it if you don't know. And then um, to expose the public endpoints from the Kubernetes cluster, we just, uh, we use the uh, Nginx Ingress, which is uh, just not another tool that, allow, that uh, creates uh, elastic load balancer in AWS and then it uh, uh, exposes the public endpoints that you need outside into the internet. Uh, then the way we use uh, Helm is that we with uh, we just uh, created and generated all the, all the Helm charts for all the individual microservices that we run. Uh, we published it into our 
private repository uh, for which we use we just use the regular S3 bucket as a the repository and we and to make it easy to work with we use the Helm uh, S3 plugin which is another great tool that I recommend and um, uh, and then basically after that so, so it's easy for us to deploy to give like a continuous deployment to just uh, make the process really fast and easy we created another uh, repository like a code repository I mean uh, where uh, which basically takes all these like little helm charts from all these little uh, microservices and creates one one giant helm chart uh, which just says okay this this we need this service in this version this service in this version and then you pretty much get a similar effect as with uh, Terraform so you have pretty much your whole uh, production stack as code, uh, which uh, helped us greatly. Uh, and to make it even easier, we included the production configuration in the repository itself and committed it to Git, which is like normally it's a very, very uh, bad thing to do unless you uh, encrypt it first. So that's what we did. We used Git Secret, which is a tool that allows you to take any uh, file, encrypt it, and then uh, commit the encrypted version of it. And then anybody else can decrypt it if they have the key. They can change it and encrypt it again, uh, commit again. So that's a great tool uh, that also helped us to speed up the process. So now we're in, the, in this stage. We already have the, uh, the services running in Kubernetes. They're connected to the old database because that's the necessary step even though it's uh, inefficient but that's a very just a very short time before we before it switches to the AWS database so then we get we got rid of the all services because we don't need them anymore and uh, now we just take the databases and then we switch right it's very easy actually no <laughs> it's very hard uh, sometimes in our, in our case it was very hard uh, the, the biggest problem was that we have because we the, of the nature of our business that we have all these devices just real-time feeding data to this to our to our cloud and then we have to like process it and save it to the database so then we can display it to our customers it's a, a lot of data and uh, since it was it, between those two databases uh, it's replicated over the internet it's also not the greatest thing to do. So, what end up uh, what ended up happening is that we were getting new data faster than they were replicated. So it was a, like a vicious cycle of death, and uh, it was just uh, horrible. And we were stressed, and we didn't know what to do. And uh, servers were just uh, using all the the databases them themselves were using more and more resources. We had to scale up the servers to like T three. 4x large, I don't know. Uh, it was a lot, and then it was four times becoming more four times more exp uh, expensive than we expected. Uh, but then finally, uh, we came up with a quick fix uh, that we realized that the data that was being the problematic data was just uh, the in nature was the monitoring data. So you don't really need that data real time to for the system to work. So we just took the old the, these collections in those databases that had these this this data, and then just we renamed it, so it goes to the side, and that in effect created like uh, new empty collections. It replicated instantly, and we could finally uh, we had both copies on both sides, and we could finally switch. So that was the original case. See the, the in the new new. Uh, in AWS, the collections were like not replicating properly, so we just moved it to the side. We replicated the empty collections, and then finally it was done. So then we could finally uh, completely cut off the old <coughs> data center, and then whoo, we migrated. Uh, <coughs> so this is our final uh, AWS uh, structure as it is at the moment. Uh, we are going to work on it. In the future as well, there's a lot of things to do, but we didn't. We have very little time, so uh, we'll see. And then, um, pretty much, this was our this is our cost 
how much it costed us before we were on AWS. We were pretty much paying about three thousand dollars a month for the old data center, and then those three months that we were migrating uh, unfortunately costed us about fifteen point five thousand dollars. Uh, when we finally fixed everything, the first real month on AWS was about five thousand dollars, and then we optimized a bit more, and we finally got to the original three thousand dollars, but on AWS. Uh, so that's about it about the migration. I can tell you also about uh, a few other things that we do on AWS, which I think are interesting. So the way we uh, auto scale our Kubernetes cluster uh, is the uh, following. So we have a, just that uh, auto scaling group with a generic Kubernetes nodes that can run any service that we need at the moment. And then we have some dedicated nodes that are dedicated for uh, RapidMQ instances that are basically the most important part of our system and they tie everything together. And, uh, but the thing with the Rabbit, Rabbit MQ uh, in our case is that most of the time it doesn't really consume much resources until that one time when it does, usually uh, sometime in the morning or one time when everybody wakes up and uh, devices connect and they start, there's just uh, the traffic goes up like this and then it goes back to nothing. So in, in that time, we, uh, we need as much, the Rabbit MQ instances need as much uh, resources as possible, but uh, in the other times we would like to pay less for. Uh, we do, would like to not have uh, unutilized resources and pay for nothing. So what we what we do is that uh, every RabbitMQ instance runs on a on an uh, <coughs> node, and uh, when there is no traffic, we kill the other nodes, so all, only these ones are left, and then they can run other services as well. But when there's uh, a lot of traffic, uh, we use CloudWatch to detect how the load of the of the servers and when the average uh, CPU and memory load go uh, goes above seventy percent, which is about like experimentally what we found works for us. Uh, that means the traffic is going up, so we start new new instances, new nodes, and so um, some of the uh, services move to the, to those, and then they free up space for the rabbit to take up the whole server and uh, when the traffic goes down uh, then when the average CPU and memory go below 40 percent that means the servers are under underutilized we start killing off the uh, the other instances so the server the uh, services move back to next to the rabbit MQ instances another in, uh, for example, how uh, example of how we use uh, serverless, since it's a very uh, sexy topic, uh, we um, so we use the lambdas for to run some uh, automatic tests in our custom uh, like uh, testing framework that we have for our customers because our customers when they write their applications they need to test. That their application, their particular application, will do what they expect on these different devices because they're so different. So they can uh, write uh, basically simple like JavaScript code as test cases that then gets pushed alongside their own application into the device and runs and then returns how the tests tests went. So for that we use uh, Lambda. So for every test case that the customer defines, we generate a new Lambda function and then in the in our UI that is for the customers to manage the devices they can just click on a run test and then that invokes the Lambda function uh, once the device pushes back the results the Lambda function returns the result to our system and then it can display it to the, uh, to the customer so that's about it 